So. Okay, in class he was talking about this, but I didn't see why. He was saying if I'm standing, if there's a wall and I'm standing like next, like if I'm, if I'm like this, and the, if the wall is here and I'm standing here, like if you shoot a bullet at me, I'll be fine, because it's not going to occur. Right. If you shoot a wave, it could get me. And that's the point. Said, that's all he said about it. Yeah, that's right. Well, that's the very same point. So again, yeah, so let's say there's someone standing right outside the door, but a little bit to the left of the door. Well, that was a great example. I like that example. So let's say, let's say someone's standing to the left of the door, and let's say I shoot a bullet. Well, they're not going to get hit by the bullet, right, because the bullet just goes straight. But let's say I start talking. Well, when I'm talking, I'm sending out sound waves, and the sound waves will bend when they get outside the door, so the person is still going to hear that sound wave that's bending outside the door. And what's really doing that is that the wave the, the point on the wave, this point at the wave that's passing right next to the door is acting like its own little source that's sending out a new little sound going like this. So even a person that's standing over here, um, not directly behind the door, is still going to get hit by that wave. So that's an important. That's what I meant when I said uh, on one of his sample exams, the instructor has a question where he says, explain something using Huygens' principle. Well, this would be an example of how you would explain something using Huygens' principle, explaining how you can hear somebody um, who's talking, if, so if somebody, if this guy over here is talking, this guy over here could still hear. But if this guy was shooting a bullet, this guy wouldn't get hit by the bullet. That's the difference between a particle and a wave. Waves spread out, and the reason they spread out is that the points at the edges act as point sources for new spherical wave fronts. So here's the point at this edge of the wave that's spreading out in this direction. And here's the point at this side that's spreading out in this direction. Now there's also a bunch of points here in the middle, but they don't really matter because when you put all the spherical waves in the middle together, you just get something flat. There's a whole bunch of spherical waves here too, but as we drew over here, when you put a whole bunch of spheres together, you just get a flat front. The only time where you get this interesting curving is when you're at the edges of the wave. That's where Huygens' principle really matters, uh, at least uh, for this curving principle. that junk was a little bit of a digression from uh, diffraction to interference, but that's something that could come up in the test, just using Huygens' principle. Um, so how does Huygens' principle help us here? So again, we have a single slit, and here's the screen. So again, a naive person would say, gee, there can't be any interference here, because since there's only a single slit, there can only be one source of light. But now we sophisticated people that know about Huygens' principle, we know that there's really a whole bunch of little point sources inside the slit. And each of these point sources, the beam from each of those point sources, if we just pick a point at random on the screen, the distance that each of these beams is traveling is going to be different. So some of the beams will uh, travel different distances, so there could be either constructive or destructive interference at this point. So we can still get this constructive and destructive interference even with a single slit. And again, I only picked this point at random. I could have drawn the same picture for any of the points on the screen. Every single point on the screen is going to get either constructive or destructive interference. OK, you can kind of think of this. I think the book calls this like an infinite slits. There's like an infinite number of slits here, because every single point is acting like a point source. All right, um, so this is another situation where you can get this interference uh, principle. Let's see if they give you an equation for that. With a single slit. Well, there was a, yeah, intensity in single slit. There's a couple of equations. Anyway, I think there was a homework problem. There was about a single slit. Uh, and again, each of these situations has a slightly different formula. All the formulas are based on uh, looking at the path length difference and seeing whether things are uh, a complete wavelength out of phase or not. 
But again, you're usually not really expected to derive the formula. They usually just give you the formula or you look it up in your cheat sheet. We derived the simplest formula at the start, but even that you usually would just look up. You just look up the formula and plug and chug. Again, a lot of these formulas are mainly, a lot of these problems are just plug and chug. You, um, you, uh, so read the problems carefully, because it might be a whole new situation we haven't talked about, but it doesn't matter what the situation is. If they give you the formula, you just have to figure out what variables go in. Um, so there's many different situations here. So in the homework, they give you some formulas that are in the book. So, uh, but anyway, so you would look up the formula, be given it, and then you would just plug in uh, appropriately here to, uh, to, to work that out. Uh, and again, I th a lot of the things would be the same. So for example, um, what does theta represent? Well, theta is still the angle from the center point to here. What does L represent? Yeah, L is still from the screen to the barrier over here. What would Y represent? Y would represent this vertical distance here. Okay. All right, so that's the uh, single slit experiment. The D is still a slit. Well, there isn't really a D here, right? Because um, remember, this is like infinite slits. Remember, D is supposed to be the distance between the slits. So they have to give you a different approach here. Um, actually, so what they do here is they invent a new variable called A. And A is the width of the single slit. This really isn't the same thing as D, because D, D would have been the distance between two slits. And here there's only one slit. So they invent a new variable, A. All right, and again, when you're doing a problem like this, they might give you three different distances. And the, uh, what the tricky part is just to figure out which one is A, which one is Y, and which one is L. Or it might be that uh, maybe they didn't give you one of the variables, and you have to process a number to, to turn it into that. OK. Uh, one thing you might wonder about is, When we were doing the, the multiple slits, we didn't worry about Wiegand's principle, right? So for example, if we have, say, here, three, uh, one, two, three, four slits, or let's say when we did the two slits. When we did two slits, we just said these were two sources of light, right? We just said two sources of light here. We didn't worry about Wiegand's principle and say that there's a different point source from every single point that's going through the slit. And the reason is when you're doing multiple slits, you use very narrow slits. When you're doing multiple slits, you use very narrow slits so that there really is not much difference between all the different waves that are coming from the different points here, according to Wiegand's principle. So when you're doing multiple slits, you would use very narrow slits um, so that you don't need to worry about Wiegand's principle and take into account the different point sources inside the slit. If the slit is very narrow, you can kind of treat the, uh, if the slit is very narrow, you can kind of treat it just like a single point. If the slit is very narrow, you can just treat it like a single point. Remember that D is not the size of the slit, D is the distance between the slits. So the slits can still be very narrow and still have a D. That, that's not too important for solving problems, but that might, uh, that's something that uh, confused me when I was looking at this at the beginning. So if you have a single slit, the slit has to be wide enough to, for there to be a fair number of points inside so that you can really have multiple sources from those points.